invited me to present today, and I'm the honor of the, uh, the last person keeping you from your journey home. So, uh, yes, I'm the infrastructure lead at the BIM Institute in the UK. And the BIM Institute provides commercial, technical, and practical support to asset owners and suppliers. And I've spent over 20 years um, working on complex and challenging construction projects. And um, a significant amount of my time has been spent in rail. Uh, and I love rail. And I've experienced firsthand the challenges of design integration, construction coordination, stakeholder engagement. And I'm passionate about delivering projects efficiently and, and safely. So I'm going to keep my presentation quite uh, graphical uh, to see if we can keep everybody awake. Um, I'm sure that there's a difference of opinion and understanding of what BIM is in the, in the room. Um, this slide's quite useful um, in explaining that it's a promising advancement in the way that assets are designed, constructed, uh, operated, and maintained. And the aim is to lower life cycle costs. It's, it's as simple as that. Uh, already in industry, and quite heavily in, in the building side of industry, we're seeing faster delivery. Um, supply chain are actually getting better margins, which makes it quite interesting. Um, safer work sites and higher performing assets. So for those who, who don't know, there are eight pillars of BIM. And now in the 10 short minutes that I've got, I'm not going to go into great detail about these pillars. Um, but these are the guidance documents and specifications that are used by project leaders and asset owners and suppliers. And they cover how, what, and when uh, data is to be utilized. Um, just a quick show of hands, perhaps. How many people are familiar with the eight pillars of BIM? About 4% of the room. So, fundamentally, BIM is centered around three core elements. There, of course, is, there's a lot of detail about the legal and classification and file types. Um, but fundamentally, we have the graphical representation, which is the 3D model that everybody likes to talk about. We've got the information, which is the data and the documents. And these are supporting uh, the design, fabrication, construction, operations, and maintenance. But we've also got the standardization. And that's something that we've, we've struggled with in construction over the years, is every organization has their own standards. Um, depending on where you are in the supply chain, you've got your own opinions uh, on that. You've got intellectual property uh, concerns and, and issues. and we've not really had a behavior uh, that's conducive to collaboration. It's, it's sometimes in construction is quite um, the opposite. So let's take a slightly deeper look um, at, into some of these. So the 3D models, uh, as we can see there, these help us to provide context for the design. I've specifically put a particularly ugly 3D model on screen, because it's not just about the pretty pictures. It's to provide us with a context of multidisciplinary clash detection. And the 3D model allows us to, to look from any angle and look for clashes in, in areas where you might not see on a, on a 2D drawing. It allows us to create an infinite number of sections, so we don't have to commit a huge amount of resources to creating sections and, and moving sections and having to try and interpret information that are in those sections. So that's a huge reduction in, in CAD time. Um, but they do also act as a frame from which to build the stakeholder engagement models, because not everybody can understand CAD models, the red and the green and the blue. It's, it's not for everyone. But I'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. The federated model is, is a very important part of, of BIM. Uh, again, multidisciplinary projects. We've got hundreds, if not thousands, of files that all need to be referenced together to provide us with a, con a contextual um, image of the site. And we need to make sure that the, the files are aggregated together, everything's referenced, and it means that people are working from the correct data. And again, I'm sure there's people in this room that have, have been impacted on delays and claims because we've used out-of-date information or information that's just not been made available. 
So the federated model makes it very easy to aggregate this information. And again, it's not about the 3D model. It's about the linked information. That's each one of these files is a model. And uh, this particular project is, is several hundred kilometers long. And it's broken down by scheme plan. And each scheme plan area also then has OLE, it has track, it has civils. And it makes it uh, bite-sized so that people can work concurrently in concurrent areas. It's not just about having one model. The way that the federated model is, is set up on a project can have a profound effect on that project's performance. So configuring it is, is absolutely essential um, to get those benefits. The common data environment, we touched on it slightly um, earlier. I think this is all quite recognizable in that we have a lot of information exchange between all the stakeholders on, on a project. And we use email, and we use shared drives, and we use a myriad of different systems. And the common data environment's job is quite simple. It's the nucleus of the project. It stores all the relevant data, including the federated model and the 3D models and technical documentation. And it makes that accessible and secure through workflows so that only the right people get to see it at the right time. So your information is protected. But you can work collaboratively, and it's there. And it's available then at the click of a button. Another challenge for major projects is controlling that information between those parties. There was a study by Reading University in the UK recently, and that showed that up to 30% of the cost of construction is attributable to information management. Now, that sounds quite high. But when you think about your working day, emailing, in meetings, on the phone, what are you doing? You're sharing information, or you're collecting information. So, Actually, those hundreds of thousands and, and millions of transactions that happen throughout the course of a project is information management. And it doesn't take much for a docket to be incorrect, and we end up with the wrong spec concrete or the wrong volume. Um, it's quite easy to, to have failures in, in that area. So the common data environment is there to make sure we have a single source of truth from which the right people at the right time can get the right information. It's, it's no more complicated than that. So, 4D BIM. This is the simulation of, of construction schedules, and hopefully this little video will explain what's going on here. So this is a, a network rail project. And we use 4D to rehearse activities before, con uh, before uh, committing the plant and the resources. And we use it to optimize the program. Now, this particular um, analysis of the contractor's schedule and the integrated program, we found, again, about 30% efficiencies. Uh, we were able to put more plant on site because we were able to visualize where and when activities were going to take place. And it turned out there were actually quite a lot of voids. And we were able to fill those voids with, with more resources. So again, if we look at work sites and how we're going to plan this, because we only get one shot at building this in the physical world, well, at least here we can build it several times in the, in the digital world. Um, it's also been um, responsible for saving, uh, one particular project saved nearly seven million pounds um, by using 4D um, in Schedule 4 and Schedule 8 costs, as well as the rework um, out of the risk pot. And um, because errors that were found in the program, and there were, there were quite a few, about 13 different problems, um, we, we were able to resolve them quite early. Um, so 4D modeling is, it does pay for itself. So what are the challenges? So I mentioned the eight pillars of BIM, and we've alluded to it earlier as well. The B in BIM does stand for building. There is no getting away from that. It was developed for the AEC sector, and there's no point in shying away from it. I know people are trying to make it into a verb to build, um, but the reality is these rules were written around architectural uh, information. So the classifications are written for buildings. Um, and, and not infrastructure. The, uh, there is a lack of, of informed and impartial support for BIM in infrastructure. We get a lot of uh, information coming from software vendors and people with um, angles. And certainly on the client side, um, there's a fragmented um, 
or potentially fragmented approach to asset information requirements, certainly from existing asset owners that have traditional systems. I think we've got a new opportunity with Rail Baltica that we've got a clean sheet and we can document these information requirements early. So there's a lot of noise and that's caused some paralysis in, in industry. Um, you don't know where to turn when there's so many hundreds of, of options and people are fearful of picking the wrong solution, whether it be software or advice. And I think one of the final ones, and probably most relevant to, to the designers in the room, is the, the rail design tools that we use today are not BIM level two compliant. They are just geometry. Um, you hear about software such as Revit, um, which is the, the graphical and the non-graphical information linked together. Well, the rail design tools don't have that. They are just the graphical. So there are some challenges um, that the industry and the software vendors need to address. And, and that is coming. And during the life of this project, we're absolutely right. Uh, we will see um, those challenges overcome. So we need to translate uh, these documents to make them relevant for rail. And that's what the BIM strategy is, is doing. Um, and we also need to start moving away from one-dimensional scheme plans, two-dimensional OLE layout plans, into simplistic uh, 3D models so we can understand the impact of uh, OLE on track and drainage. Um, obviously, it's um, in-cab signaling on this project, so we don't have signal sighting issues. Um, but still, these types of documents are are becoming obsolete. They're the design tools now automatically create 3D models uh, of the design uh, without having to go into, into flat form like this. So we've got to get some new skills for our, for our designers. Um, and, and we talked about that previously. But we also need to overcome the silo mentality. There are silos between engineering disciplines. Everybody thinks they're the center of the universe. And we need to make and breed um, a collaborative environment which encourages people to be considerate of other disciplines and not just plow ahead with their own agenda. We've also got to um, break down silos between project functions, because it's not just about the engineering, but also the contractors, the stakeholders, the commercial, and, and the project management team. But if we achieve this, then we will significantly reduce project delivery risks. It's proven in the field. And we will deliver uh, some better outcomes. Now, I think it would be sacrilegious to, to um, not put some Hollywood BIM uh, in my presentation to, uh, to drive this. This particular screenshot from a, from a, a reality model was used um, by the Heritage Committee to make a decision on planning permission. And historically, they would have to go through drawings or an artistic uh, impression. What we were able to do uh, here, and if it works, the same model that is built for driver training was used to engage those stakeholders. And instead of having nine months of discussions to get through planning, we did it in three. Because they just they understood, oh, I recognize that. I stand there. We've removed the need to interpret information. And I do chuckle um, sometimes, because the engineers don't like this. It's pretty pictures. It's not for the engineers. But if we peel back those textures, we have the engineering model. If we peel back that model, we have the point cloud from the survey. It's all connected. It's, there's no new information required. Now, this is highly sped up. Um, but they, the promise here is to have a virtual railway or a digital twin. We're already looking in the UK at adding sensor information here so we can get real-time feeds of the asset performance. And we can see where they are. We don't have to interpret them from a schematic. We've got connected data sets. And they're connected to the databases uh, that we use in the assets. You know, that is the, the, the model that underpins that reality model. But we also use that model for operational training, simulation um, of signaling systems and signaling performance. So we can introduce faults into the system. 
And it's also used for digital um, maintenance operating procedures. So tasks that are carried out rarely are all being developed and built from that model. So thank you very much for listening. And I look forward to speaking with you again in the future.